Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Elias. I'm going to be giving the CLSP seminar talk today. Um, and this is a practice job talk. So I welcome any feedback that you might have. Uh, but it's also kind of right up against the time limit. And so if uh, you could hold on to your questions until the end, that would be ideal. Here's an overview of the talk. I'm going to start with a bit of background and kind of the vision underlying the research that I'm going to talk about today. And then I'm going to get into sort of two paths towards achieving the goals that I'll, I'll lay out in a minute. And I'll try to tie those paths together again at the end. The first goal is broadly to enable seamless interactions between people and digital agents and to allow those interactions to take place using language. And I think something that's crucial to that is to actually examine how people use language with each other to communicate and, for example, to look at the areas where that kind of communication fails or is difficult. But I also want to highlight that language is not only a tool for communication, but also for reasoning, planning, and thought. And so I also want to look a little bit at leveraging language to improve digital agents even outside of communication. And I think there are two distinct paths that I followed in my research towards achieving this, um, with a lot of the research kind of cutting across these different categories. And the first path involves interaction, execution, and grounding. So here I'm focused on extracting structure from language. Uh, often those structures are going to be executable. And when we're dealing with executable structures, we'll have to deal with some form of grounding those structures to the world. Um, when we're dealing with language, we're also going to have to deal with implicit phenomena, and we're going to have to handle those kind of in a, in a more elegant way. And these are things like common sense knowledge. So when we're communicating and communicating with language, we're making all sorts of assumptions about how the world is and what our interlocutors might know. Um, and these assumptions might pose challenges. Uh, we also might have to deal with vagueness and ambiguity. So language is kind of inherently vague and ambiguous. Um, and that causes a lot of problems. It can cause problems between people, but it can especially cause problems once we add these AI agents into the loop. So I'll start with the first path here, which is interaction, execution, and grounding. And I'll start by talking about structure and why it's important. I think uh, a sort of natural question given the last 10 years is why we need structure, given that we've gotten quite far with sort of minimal structure in terms of deep learning. One of the reasons is that structure is nicely interpretable. So if we're dealing with applications where we are interfacing with humans, we might want to have that interpretability. That interpretability. That's not something that we necessarily have from dense representation. So if we have a dense representation of meaning, it might be hard to tell what, uh, just from examining it, what it actually means. Another reason to have structure is that the there are existing APIs in the world, which all deal with these kind of structured code-like representations. And so there are APIs for doing all sorts of cool things in the world, like ordering pizza or controlling a robot arm or maybe controlling your calendar. And these, these types of structures aren't going away. Um, these APIs already exist and we want to be able to use them. Following the motivation of interpretability, I'm gonna talk a bit about our first type of structure, which is universal decompositional semantics. Uh, and this structure is designed for linguistic analysis. So it's designed for describing the kind of meaning and, and some of the content of an utterance like this. So we, a UDS graph starts with an utterance. And on top of that utterance is a universal dependency, dependencies syntactic parse, which reflects the syntactic relationships between the tokens in the input and um, sort of the, yeah, the, just the syntactic tree effectively of that input. And what's crucial for uh, 
later topic is that this representation is lexicalized, which means that every node in the input corresponds, or sorry, every token in the input rather corresponds to a single node in the graph. So once you have the tokens in the input, you already know what the nodes in your graph will be. Um, this is in contrast to the semantic representation in UDS, which is built on top of this universal dependencies parse and encodes the events, the participants, and the relationships between the events and participants in this sentence. So for example, there's this catching event and um, the mouse and the cat are the participants of that event. And the kind of core feature of UDS are these scalar semantic uh, annotations that are crowdsourced. So these are annotated on a scale from minus three to three. They cover a variety of semantic axes and they encode these sort of common sense inferences that, that English speakers can make about the situations expressed in the text. So for example, I'll highlight this one factuality. So this is how likely an event is to have actually happened. And when you read a sentence like this, you can come away knowing that this catching event is likely to have happened. And another one might be awareness. So this is whether an argument was aware in an event. And so unfortunately, it seems like the mouse was probably aware of this eating event. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about this, um, you can check out our LREC paper from 2020 where we described this data set. But I want to move on to the modeling component. The model looks like a lot like a sequence to sequence model. Um, it's actually a sequence to graph model. So the input gets embedded. Here we have uh, a number of featureizers. So we have uh, BERT, GLOVE, character CNN, and that goes to an encoder. The encoder representation then goes to a decoder. And that encoder decoder framework can either be an LSTM and a transformer. And I'll focus mostly on results from the transformer here. The decoder produces a node representation, which is used to predict the semantic nodes. It also produces these edge representations, which then can be used to predict edges between these nodes. And that happens in an online fashion in each time step we feed in the previously predicted node as well as the previously predicted relationship. And we repeat that process until we hit an end of sequence token, at which point we can pass all of the node and edge representations through these node and edge attribute networks that are going to do the task of actually predicting the UDS attributes. And this makes UDS a really unique modeling problem because we not only have this kind of discrete and structured graph but we also have these scalar attributes. And so that makes it this, this kind of interesting multitask learning problem. Um, this is work that I started on a paper that, uh, was, that appeared at ACL 2020. But most of what I'm about to talk about is in the realm of joint syntactic and semantic parsing. And that was work that we presented at Tackle. So I want to come back to this question of lexicalized versus non-lexicalized representations. So if you remember this image, there's this lexicalized representation where you already know what the nodes in your graph are going to be when you see your input. And this is a really strong inductive bias for modeling because it means that you really only need an encoder because your encoder has one representation for every token in the input. And so you don't want to have this decoder that's going to have to reconstruct your input. We can contrast that with something that's non-lexicalized like UDS, where you might have extra nodes in your graph, you might have input tokens that are missing from your graph. And so you want to have this flexibility of a sequence to sequence or sequence to graph approach. And the way we're gonna implement this in our model is gonna look kind of similar to a sort of old school NLP pipeline, where what we used to do was we'd take our text and we'd get some syntactic features. And then using those features, we'd come up with some semantic parse. And this isn't ideal because we might have errors propagating from the syntax forward, but I think it's a strong way to, a sort of intuitive way to think of this problem. What we're gonna do instead is parameterize everything with neural networks. And we're gonna train this end to end so that information is flowing back from the semantic parsing task 
but also from the syntactic parsing task. So this now becomes this multitask learning setup where we have first a syntactic parser, and those representations are then informing the syntactic, par the semantic parse. And we, what we want to see here is this kind of mutual, mutually beneficial relationship between syntax and semantics, which we would intuitively want to see that syntax kind of forms these building blocks that then inform the semantics, and maybe the semantics also constrain the syntax when you have sort of syntactic ambiguities. And so you want to see a mutual benefit here. But what we've seen in past work is that you can use syntax as an auxiliary signal for semantics, but what ends up happening is that you actually get very bad syntactic performance. So it's, it's quite hard to end up with a strong semantic parser that also can do syntactic parsing. And the way we're gonna try to accomplish this task is by adding this syntactic parser to the encoder. And that takes advantage of that lexicalization bias that we have for universal dependencies parsing. We can add in a residual connection from the predicted syntactic parse through to the decoder. So we're calling this encoder side syntactic parsing because we're doing the syntactic parsing at the encoder side, sort of lower down in the pipeline. And then higher up in the pipeline, we're doing semantic parsing and we're using the flexibility from that sequence to graph approach. I also briefly want to mention the changes that we made to the transformer because these come up, come up again in later models and, and, and later in the presentation. So the transformer was developed for high resource machine translation, where you have millions of examples of bytext. And in our case, we only have about 10,000 training examples. So we had to make some changes to get this to work at all. Um, and those changes were pulled from the low resource MT literature. We swapped the order of the feed forward and normalization layers. We scaled down the initialization of the weights and we also changed the number of warm-up steps for the learn rate scheduling. Looking at the results, um, S-score here is a measure of the semantic graph performance. So it, it a quick question before you get to yeah. Um, could could you go back a couple slides to the uh, little friends? Little friends? There, yeah. Um, so I don't actually uh, I, I, maybe I should uh, understand that what you're doing is taking a Turby parse forward, uh, or maybe you're just taking the embedding. Just the embedding. For parsing. Yeah. Um, so we're not actually doing the the decoding of the UD parse when we're doing this residual connection, because then it becomes uh, non-differentiable. So we're doing just the embeddings before the softmax. And those are embeddings of the edge of labeled edges. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and when you are uh, training using, you have supervised uh, UD parsing data. Yes. And you, um, so you're multitasking or you're pre-training and then freezing? We, we did both actually, but for the English results, we had parallel data. So we have parallel UD parses and UDS parses. And you just continually train on both of those yeah. equally weighted? Um, there's a uh, loss weighting. I forget exactly what it is, um, but there's there's a factor to kind of get the losses to be roughly the same magnitude. Uh, okay, thank you. So for the results, we do see a small but consistent benefit from adding this encoder side syntactic parsing. Um, so syntax does provide a nice signal for the semantics, but the real test here is going to be whether we can maintain strong syntactic parsing, since that was the problem that uh, previous work couldn't really address. Um, and what we see is that there actually is a nice performance from the syntactic parser. So we get, uh, in terms of un unlabeled attachment score, so this is uh, how well you can predict the edge heads, um, we get a very small increase, and then we get a sort of equally small decrease for labeled attachment score, which is predicting the edge heads and predicting the label. Um, and both of these are better than the baselines that we're comparing against. So in this sense, there's uh, we, we got this nice success here that we can do joint syntactic and semantic parsing without sacrificing our syntactic performance. Um, and at this point, I want to move on to another application of this model, which is in executable parsing. 
And this is based around a longstanding goal in AI, which is kind of to use language as this API for interaction. So this is something that um, probably many of you will recognize this figure from the Sherdlu system from Terry Winograd's work. Um, it's been a longstanding goal in AI to be able to give instructions to a, a digital agent, even in it's going as far back as sort of the earliest conceptions of robots in science fiction. This has been how we've conceived of artificial intelligence. But a challenge here is dealing with the variability of natural language. So natural language, unlike uh, logic or programming language, has a lot of variability, it has a lot of noise, and we're going to have to kind of strip that away. Um, and the way this is typically framed is as this kind of text-to-code problem. Uh, this is nice because, as I mentioned before, we have all of these existing execution engines and APIs for executing this code. But we also have some data sources that exist already for doing this kind of problem, and we can annotate data for this. One of those sources is the SM Calflow data set. Um, this is a data set that I'll talk about in this section. It's in a calendaring domain. So you have utterances like this about making meetings, uh, inviting people to things. And the output is this Lisp-like program. But as anyone who's tried to write anything in Lisp probably knows, you run into a lot of problems with uh, things like parentheses. And so modeling this surface structure might not actually be ideal. Um, and instead, what we're going to do is model the underlying execution graph. So here's this, this graph that can easily be translated to Lisp. And because we have this strong sequence to graph model, we can more or less apply it out of the box to this problem. And so that's what we did in this paper. This paper covers a lot of other things. Um, I'm really just going to talk about the model here. Um, and what we did was take this UDS model and remove the attribute prediction uh, multi-layer perceptrons and make some adjustments to it in order to get it to work for SM Calflow. And it actually turns out that this got state of the art on SM Calflow. Since then, some new work has come out that I think superseded our work, but for a while there, this was the best performing uh, SM Calflow model. And instead of talking too much about the specifics of the model, I want to move to some more recent work that I've been doing on calibration and semantic parsing. I think this is important because when we're doing task-oriented parsing, we're parsing in order to act. So the output of our model is going to be executed. Um, and the goal of that model is to enable interaction with people. So if the model is uncertain about something that a person has said, we want to be able to have access to that information, and we want to be able to maybe have a follow-up interaction where the model kind of interacts back with the person and asks for a clarification or even just refuses to do an action that it's not confident about. And in order to do that, we need to have a calibrated model. And what that means is that when we plot accuracy against model confidence, we should get this nice correlation where confidence and accuracy are basically perfectly correlated. And that's kind of a superpower in this context because you have access to model confidence even without executing your result. And so you can, if you, if you have this nice correlation, you can basically predict on average what your accuracy will be based on the confidence. In practice, what ends up happening is that we'll often get models that are either under underconfident or overconfident with overconfident models being more common. Um, and this is something that I explored in this work, which is currently uh, still a work in progress where we looked at firstly how well calibrated semantic parsing models are. And we looked at two data sets across a number of different models, uh, MISO being one of those models. MISO is our, our UDS model that turned into an SM Calflow model. And we looked at some other models as well from different paradigms. So we have these. Um, text-to-text -text models like T5 and BART, which are pre-trained pre transformer models, uh, pre-trained on gobs and gobs of text. Um, these are trained to predict the surface form of the LISP as opposed to the underlying graph structure. And we have a lot of different sizes of models. And what we see is that all of them are more or less uh, surprisingly well calibrated. But there is a bit of a trade-off here between calibration and performance. And we see that the best performing model, which is BART large, 
also has the worst calibration performance. Um, and so this kind of motivates us using MISO for the next part of the talk, where we'll show what you can actually do with a calibrated model. And specifically, we're going to focus on the trade-off between usability and safety in this kind of task-oriented setting. So you can think of this trade-off as a trade-off between how often you're going to have to repeat yourself when you're interacting with this agent, so that's the usability of the system, versus how often it's going to be wrong when it does something, which is the safety. Um, this might be less of a concern in the calendaring domain where you can easily undo things, but later on I'll talk about a, re a physical domain where it's maybe more clear why you can't just guess and then hope for the best when you're when you're doing these kind of task oriented things. We can think of kind of one extreme of this, which would be the full usability system where we just execute everything that we predict. And this is going to result in the user not having to repeat themselves very much, but it's also going to result in a lot of incorrect programs being executed. On the other hand, we can think of a full safety setting where we just unplug our agent and do nothing. Obviously, that's not a very useful system, but it is very safe. Maybe there's a more balanced way to do this. If we have a calibrated model, we can tune a threshold based on the confidence. And we can say that everything falling below that confidence should be rejected and everything above that confidence should be accepted. And if we do that, we'll end up with a curve that looks something like this, where we have um, safety increasing as we increase that threshold and usability decreasing as we increase the threshold. And we'll have some crossover point that kind of represents the best that we can do with this thresholding system. And a question we asked in the paper is whether we can beat that. So if we add a human in the loop, can we kind of do better than the best that we can do with a confidence-based threshold? And that's what we did by introducing this did you mean system, which gives us the ability to recover some of those low confidence programs that we would have thrown away under the thresholding system. The reason it's called did you mean should be clear from this animation here. So we have a user interacting with the model, and the user provides some utterance, and the model makes a prediction with some confidence. And because the model is relatively well calibrated, we can consult this kind of calibration plot. And we can see that with this confidence, our expected probability of success here is about 0 0.98. And those odds are pretty good, so we'll just execute that program. But we might also have an utterance that's a little bit harder to parse. It might have abbreviations or typos or other out of distribution qualities like ambiguity and vagueness that make it hard to parse. When we get a prediction, that prediction will have low confidence. And We'll consult our little chart here, and we'll see that our probability of success here is quite low as well. But instead of just throwing this away the way we would with the uh, with the with the um, thresholding system, we're going to instead gloss the prediction. We're going to back translate the predicted um, Lisp expression into English, and we're going to ask the user to confirm that that's what they meant. And this is why it's called "Did you mean?" The model is going to say, did you mean, and then rephrase the input. And in this case, the user is going to have the option to either accept or reject. And if they accept, then we'll execute the program. We did a user study to evaluate how well this works. So we took 100 examples and we measured the coverage, which is the percentage of programs that were executed. So if this is all of the programs in our in our uh, the hundred examples that we have, coverage is the percentage we execute, and risk, which is a measure of sort of inverse measure of safety, is the percentage of those executed programs that were incorrect. And when we look at the first baseline, which is just to accept everything, we end up with hundred percent coverage. We also end up with sixty seven percent of those programs being incorrect. So our risk is sixty seven percent. When we look at the second baseline, which is just to set a threshold, here we tuned a threshold on the validation data and then applied it to those 100 examples. And we see that our coverage is much lower, but so is our risk. So we're executing fewer programs, but a lower percentage of those programs are incorrect. Nevertheless, we want to do better than that. So when we look at the performance of did you mean, 
we see that our coverage improves because we're now recovering some of those programs that would have been thrown away. But at the same time, our risk is lower. And this might seem counterintuitive, but it's because risk is a percentage of coverage and our coverage here is higher. So there's a different denominator. And earlier I mentioned that these safety considerations are going to be especially important in a physical setting. So I wanna talk briefly about some work that I did in robot manipulation which is a setting where these kinds of considerations come up, where you can't just undo your actions. There's also an added challenge here, which is that the API isn't known, right? So in, in something like CalFlow or a different executable semantic parsing formalism, you assume that when you predict a function like create meeting, you can execute that function, you already know how to do it. But in a manipulation task, you might be able to predict a function like pick up block, but now you have to also go and learn how to pick up a block. And that learning takes place under these physical constraints and under uh, constraints of getting data. So get, like the cost of getting data for a robotic manipulation task is a lot, hard, is a lot higher um, than the cost of annotating language examples. And this is based on some work that we presented at Coral 2021, where we were guiding rearrangement tasks with natural language. To kind of uh, illustrate what I mean by that, I'll play, hopefully this video plays. Um, this is a demo of our model. Um, it looks like the video is not playing. See if this works. There we go. Are we supposed to be uh, no, there's no there's no sound here. So we just have these uh, language commands, and we're picking up the so the the robot arm is picking up blocks according to the language command. It localizes the block to pick up. It tries to pick it up. If it fails, it'll it'll retry, and then it localizes the block to where the location where to where it wants to drop the block and it puts the block down. And so you can see that if you mess something up here, you might destroy your whole stack. Um, here's a sketch of the system that we used for this task. The idea here is to be able to use a pre-trained manipulation policy. And the reason we wanna do that is because training these manipulation policies is expensive and the, the task has this kind of natural decomposition into learning how to act and learning where to act. So you can learn how to stack blocks without these language constraints. And that's a much denser signal. And then you can learn how to localize where to pick and place blocks without learning how to act. And you can separate those two learning tasks and then combine them. So that's what we did here. The pre-trained manipulation policy produces these Q values, which are kind of the expected reward for each pixel in the image. And so this is language agnostic. This is just the pixel where the robot should pick up a block if that's the block to pick up. And normally it'll just pick up the best possible block. So that would be this block kind of in the lower left-hand corner, which has nothing surrounding it. It's the easiest one to pick up. The language component is the sort of main contribution of this paper, and it takes this image and a natural language, uh, uh, templatic language utterance in this case, and it produces a mask, which we're going to intersect with our Q values to find the maximum pixel that satisfies our language constraint. Here's a sketch of the model that we built for this. We take an input image, which is an RGB image combined with a depth image, and we take our language command, we embed our language, and we take our image and tile it up into these patches, which we then concatenate with our language. And that all gets fed into a transformer encoder, which produces a representation for all of the language tokens, as well as all of the image patches. We take those image patch representations and feed them through a multi-layer perceptron that's trained to do this binary task of predicting which, which patches to mask and which to leave unmasked. So here there's one patch that's left unmasked. 
And when we reconstruct the image based on those patches, we see that it falls on the green block, which is where we should place that red block. In practice, we have two branches of this, one that predicts a grasping mask and one predicts that predicts a placing mask. So there's a shared transformer layer that encodes the image and language. And then there's a transformer that predicts which block to pick up and another that predicts which block to put, where to put a block down. And this is sort of a binary semantic segmentation task conditioned on the language. But we had very little training data for this. So for the real images for stacking, which was one of the tasks, and for row making, we only had about 1,200 images per task. Um, and so we had to apply some of the same techniques that we had for the UDS parsing and for SM CalFlow to get the transformer to work in this context. Uh, but those techniques worked, even though this is like a very different prediction task. When we look at the results, we see a higher percentage of both rows and stacks being completed when we use the transformer model as compared to our baselines, as well as a higher percentage of the correct colored block being picked up. And when the model succeeds, it succeeds in fewer actions than the baselines. But those results are on templatic language, which is not the same as real language. Um, the, we also wanted to have some results looking at real language. So we looked at a date, an existing data set from Jonathan Bisk's group is from 2018, where they had these scenes with blocks that have these logos on them, and they're rearranged into kind of different organizations based on um, kind of, they, they start by building some structure and then they deconstruct it, they reverse that and then annotate it. And they have actual crowdsourced annotations. And I think that's key because these crowdsourced annotations have all sorts of interesting natural language phenomena like ambiguity and in this case ellipsis, right? So here's this, this square gets mentioned and then in the second sentence, the annotator is talking about the lower left corner of the square, but that's not clearly expressed. That's something that needs to be inferred. So in order to model this, we converted this data set into our simulator so that we could get the images that we needed to put into our model. And I'll just show the results on block accuracy. We have some more metrics in the paper, but what we see is that our masks are much better than the baseline at localizing which block, uh, sort of identifying the correct block to pick up. Um, and again, there are more, more metrics in the paper, but for the sake of time, I want to move on to vagueness and ambiguity, because I think this is a kind of nice segue into that component of the talk. Since we just saw how once we start dealing with real data and real language from people, we end up with things like underspecification or ellipsis or ambiguity and vagueness that might trip up our model. And I want to give some, some sort of real world examples of this where it, where it might cause problems. So one example that people you could think of is sort of in the legal domain, we have these vague terms, right? Like adult, child, or, or resident that need to be rigorously defined in order to have laws. So when do you count as an adult? Well, someone has to put some number on that, but when you zoom in really closely at that number, it seems kind of arbitrary. And so why is it 18 years old and not 18 years old in one day or minus one day? Um, there's this sort of gradient of, of adulthood. Um, and I think more comically, kind of famously, newspaper headlines are often ambiguous, and this leads to some funny misunderstandings. So each of these headlines has one reading, which is probably obvious. That's sort of the, the preferred reading. But if you look too closely at them, you'll have a picture of Tom Hanks tripping his wife and then shouting at people. Um, and so these can, these can lead to kind of funny misunderstandings. And I want to talk about a paper where we focused on ambiguous predicates um, in visual question answering. So we focused here on gradable adjectives like sunny and cloudy. Uh, this is work that we presented as an abstract at the Society for Computation and Language, as well as the unimplicit workshop at ACL 2021. Um, and since I've been talking for a while, I'll, I'll get some audience participation here. Um, so 
just by a show of hands, who thinks that it's cloudy in this image? Oh, okay, good. All right. Uh, what about this image? All right. And then we've got this image. Uh, so the good news is that all of you are now qualified to participate in my Mechanical Turk tasks because you agree with annotators. Um, basically, everyone agrees that the image on the right is cloudy. The image on the left is not cloudy, except for Tom. Um, but this image in the middle is a little more, it, it's sort of overcast. It's not quite as cloudy as the image on the right, but it's definitely not sunny either. And so people hedge, but when we take a model like Lexmert, which was at the time sort of the state of the art uh, visual question answering model, we see that it doesn't hedge. So if you look at its logits here, you get a sort of all or nothing strategy where it predicts it's either 100% cloudy or 100% sunny, and there's not a lot happening in between. So there's sort of this calibration problem, which might be an issue if we wanted to use this model in some kind of, uh, in some kind of pipeline. And I want to contrast this also with ambiguous questions. So we have another work that's currently uh, under review about ambiguous questions and visual question answering. So this is a quite similar domain. But the problem here is different because previously with vague questions, we had this kind of graded scale of things that are sunny. And it's really hard to draw a boundary and say, this is the boundary where everything to the left of it is not sunny and everything to the right is sunny. Um, and this is necess not necessarily the case for an ambiguous term, right, or an ambiguous sentence. You might have very discrete categories, but you just have multiple possible interpretations. And so I'll give an example of that from the data set that we introduced in this paper. Our data set has these ambiguous questions, and it has the answers from the VQA data. So each question has multiple answers, and the answers here are grouped by the underlying question that they're answering. So we're not looking at like visually ambiguous stimuli here. We're really just looking at uh, linguistically ambiguous questions. And what we see is that these groups correspond to kind of different underlying questions. So we had annotators group answers by the underlying question and then rewrite those questions based on those groups. And so these questions should ideally be disambiguating, right? So what species of flowers are these should point very clearly to daisy and hydrangea. And we don't necessarily even have to agree within that group, right? Those are two totally different answers, but they're both answers to the same question. We then proposed a model for uh, trying to do two things. So the model takes in an image and an answer, and it produces a question. And we wanted to see if we can use this model to group answers according to their underlying questions and also to rewrite questions to be less ambiguous. And a key point here is that we're not, our, we don't use our data set for training. So our data set is, is quite small and we really only use it for evaluation. What we do is train on the whole VQA data set. We just train with images and answers and then the original question. And our hope is that over the course of the data set, we'll see enough similar images and answers that will start to kind of average things out and learn how to disambiguate. In order to evaluate this, we did another human evaluation where we had 100 image answer pairs. For each pair, we got three questions. We have the original question from the VQA data set. We have the question as rewritten by the model and the question as rewritten by the human annotator. And our hope is that when we ask annotators to rate answers as acceptable or not, they'll rate answers from the original answer group as acceptable and rate distractor answers from another answer group as unacceptable when we give them the rewritten questions. So to give another example of this, if we have this original question, which is ambiguous, and we ask people whether the answers are acceptable, we expect to see that both the target and the distractor are rated as acceptable because both of these can be thought of as answers to this question. But if we change to one of the disambiguated questions, we'll now see the distractor be rated as not acceptable because it doesn't make sense to say purple when you've, you're asked what species of flower are these. 
And that's what we see when we do this human evaluation. So for the original data, there's no significant difference between the actual answer from the answer group and the distractor, which makes sense because the question was ambiguous to begin with. But when we look at the both human and model disambiguated questions, we see a significant drop from the rating of the actual answer to the distractor answer. So to summarize everything so far, we've seen structure being used for linguistic description, for execution, as well as for manipulation, and then following some of the challenges that we saw in that manipulation framework, we looked at vagueness and ambiguity. But I don't want to leave the impression that these are sort of separate phenomena. We can have vagueness intersecting with structure. For example, if you had an, an instruction for something like SMCAL flow like this, you might get a gradient of times where this term around is sort of vague. And it might tell you that noon is preferred, but 1201 is OK. And there's this sort of drop off as you get further and further away from noon. Or you might have something that's ambiguous that has these sort of two, uh, these are sort of just pseudocode um, representations of the different meanings that this could have. So you could have inviting someone for dinner, or maybe you have a contact, like a, a point of contact for a particular dinner event, and you want to invite them to something else. And so in future work, I'm very interested in trying to kind of tackle these two threads at the same time. And more generally, I think um, if you take the sort of range of natural language phenomena that are out there and you plot them by how frequent they are, you might get this kind of Zipfian distribution where a small number of phenomena are very frequent and a large tail of phenomena that kind of represent the majority of phenomenal types uh, appear less frequently. And I think at this point, we've maybe reached a point where we're getting pretty good at dealing with these things that happen very frequently. But we still have a lot of problems with the long tail. And so that's really what I'm excited about working on in the future. And so with that, um, I'll open the floor for more questions and thank everyone for listening. So the first one has to do with back when you're talking about did you mean? Mm -hmm. right. So I guess one of the issues is that it can also get very annoying if something keeps asking did you mean this? Did you mean this? Yes. So I'm I'm expecting that there is a way to say that it's not simply if I execute this it's wrong and that's terrible versus like you know so. I should, there's no cost that takes to them. There's probably a cost associated with the action, including things like whether the action can be undone. Mm -hmm. There are strategies like implicit confirmation. Like in the example that you gave, your answer could be, well, you have nothing at the end of the day today. And if you didn't mean end of the day, the question is, I didn't mean end of the day. Right. So when you train the model, is it, uh, like, do you have something built in that they can be a cost that they can minimize rather than? So the, the actual system right now is based on a cutoff. So we say that if you have less than, uh, based on the confidence, less than a two and three chance of getting things right, then you should ask for confirmation. But that could be tuned based on different uh, kind of different considerations. So it could be tuned based on the type of program that's being predicted or even an individual user's preferences. Right, what I'm thinking is more like a, what is the cost of this action if it is wrong mm -hmm. and times the probability that it's wrong rather than right. simply. Yeah, so it could, it could be turned into kind of this utility based thing where you see what the, what the negative utility would be of this particular action. Like if you send a, whatever, a blast email to a hundred people that has a, a much higher negative utility than like accidentally inviting someone to a meeting or something like that. Um, sure. Yeah. Because the, the, a lot of these uh, deployed dialogue systems employ the in-house confirmation mm -hmm. quite often. 
Yeah. So I, I actually had a slide that didn't make it in for time that had Clippy from uh, oh, yeah. the, the old Microsoft Office. And that was a, a case where on paper, it seemed like a, a very good idea. But in practice, people got really annoyed with it because it would really only trigger for things that were already kind of obvious. So you'd, you'd write like, dear so-and-so, and it would say, you know, oh, it looks like you're trying to write a letter. And it would do that every single time that you tried to write a letter. And that got really annoying. And so people just turned it off. Um, and so that's something that you can do if you have this calibrated model is you can compute these utilities and say, like, even for a particular user, they might have a different preference and want more help or less help than other users. And you can add that in, but you need to have that, that calibrated model. So the other question I had was in the space of ambiguity, the way you had set up uh, the mechanism. Uh, like what I'm thinking is things can be ambiguous in many ways. And like, you know, so what kind of flowers that this is looking at the same time? I mean, purple or hydrangea would be one sort of uh, alternative, the third one could be plastic. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, what I'm thinking is, where, how do you circumscribe the ambiguity? So, yeah. People will interpret things and I'll mean many things than they are. That was, yeah, that was one of the, the main challenges in that paper. So, we actually have an ontology in the paper that's aligned to partly aligned to prop bank that gives reasons for why things are ambiguous basically so there are different categories that appear in the data set and one of them is this kind of kind question where if you ask what kind of x is this people kind of partition the space of possibilities differently and will pick different kinds of things so they might pick a color or, you know, if you say, what kind of car is this? Someone might say fast or sports car or Mercedes or something. So you have different, different ways to partition up the space of cars and then pick a cell in that partition. Um, but we have a lot of other, like there are a lot of other reasons in there as well. So there are things like causality. Um, so if you have like the title of the paper is why did the chicken cross the road? And it's sort of a joke about these causal questions. Um, because you can have two different types of answers to that. You can have a reason. So you can say like, because it was hungry or you can have a purpose, which is like to get to the other side and different annotators will give different answers along those lines as well. And so we do have this, but, but annotating that ontology was really difficult because just based on the answer, it's sometimes hard to tell why someone answered the way they did, like what their interpretation of the question was that, led them to answer in the way they did. Uh, yeah, Jason. So on the uh, time ambiguity paper, uh, it seemed like your methods were maybe a little related to chain of thought uh, if you were to try to put them into a question answering system. So I can imagine something where uh, the system says, well, OK, here are my top 20 answers and then include purple and titrangio. <laughs> Um, the, the, um, and then it says, well, okay, if I would, if I were going to answer uh, these various things, right. the question what would be, yeah. uh, and say, and then the chain of thought answer would be something like, if you mean, I, when you say X, mm -hmm. I think you meant X prime. Right. Uh, and the answer to X prime is like, is, yeah. uh, and the way that it might get to X prime would be this intermediate thing of working backwards from possible answers, which is not how chain of thought is usually done, but it does seem like you could integrate it to that. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I think there's, there's generally, there's a connection between that and chain of thought. And then also between this, the like, did you mean system and the same sort of chain of thought where the system is basically saying, here's what I think you meant, or if you had wanted to say this, then this is, this would have been the right way to say it. And I think that has a lot of promise also for teaching users how to interact with a system because people give weird queries to these systems and you might get some ambiguous query that's hard to parse and then say, actually, you know, I, I would have an easier time with your query if you phrased it this way and I'd be able to give you this answer if that's what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah there's a sense in which the um, interpretability of chain of thought uh, means that 
humans can intervene at the different steps. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, they can start in the middle, I think, which is what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, say, okay, the system is rephrasing uh, for max tax prime. Maybe I should ask tax prime in the future. Right. Uh, or if it misrephrased, then you could. Uh, right. You can see what the, uh, the misunderstanding you, was. You have to understand the style. You keep the style of X prime, but you change the content. Yeah. Yeah, David. So going back to the blocks world video, uh, one of the queries was uh, put the uh, blue block on the yellow block. Mm -hmm. Was that an example of, of uh, latent handling of uh, discourse focus? Because you had previously mentioned that yellow block is so two of them, or that is not a good choice. That's uh, that part of it is scripted. Um, so the the high level instructions are kind of given according to this script where at the beginning of the task, we pick an order that we want the blocks to be in. So in that case, I think it was green, yellow, blue, and then red. Um, and then the instructions are given step by step. And the next instruction is only given if the previous instruction succeeded. So this is a, a additional condition that they have to be part of the, the stack. It, yeah, exactly. Um, and so it's yeah, so the the basically the planning component here is is like completely deterministic and just based on the like following the instructions from the script. Okay, go back to the slide of the uh, highly human response group. Yeah, so so the top one, I'm a little surprised that you're not seeing the more of the what's sort of machine behavior. They were actually asked not to say. How cloudy is it? But a uh, ruin is it cloudy or not? The, the other one would, would not be what I would expect. Right. So to to clarify the human task here, the people people were given a sliding bar rather than so these are not just aggregated votes from a lot of different people. Um, so the example that I gave in in the interaction is actually kind of artificial because. Every all of the annotators here were given a sliding bar and were able to kind of hedge along a scale from zero to a hundred. So these are different tasks. The upper one is how cloudy is it? Well, the bottom one is a little bit of choice. Hence well, the so the, the task at the top is a sliding bar from zero being labeled as no and a hundred being labeled as yes. Um, and the model has the same capability. Right, because it has this logit output space where it could predict fifty percent zero, fifty percent yes, and fifty percent no. It's not rewarded by L two or something. It's rewarded by right. Log blocks, which is different. Uh, so I think David's point is fair. I think that LX board is actually being asked to make a binary choice. Yes, although you it can hedge its bets, but hedging yeah. bets is different from saying hedging bets between. Uh, I think it's. Uh, pretty likely to be completely cloudy and not so likely to be not cloudy at all is different from saying it's fairly cloudy. Right. Yeah, I'll have to look at the specific instructions that we gave, but I, I think that's, yeah, that's a fair point. Maybe I can ask a quick question about your long tail at the end. Yeah. Um, so I have shown long tail slides like this, but I don't actually know what they mean uh, because I don't know how to bin the phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you you made a comment that we're getting better at the um, we're getting better at the head at the frequent phenomena, um, but it's also possible I think that uh, the there's a spillover effect where things that we maybe used to think of as uh, some outlier, we can now get by generalization. Yes. For the phenomena that we're doing better on. In other words, the distinction between different phenomena is a, yeah. uh, given from above. It, it is, and it, I think it's influenced exactly by how well we can we can deal with them. So I think like what would be, like it's sort of based on the current state of how well we can model that thing. So once something becomes easy, we tend to think of it as uh, in this this sort of head, even though, and, and, and this is definitely more of a metaphor since I don't actually have like a count of how frequent a certain syntactic construction is, let's say in, in a corpus. Um, 
but yeah, I think, I think it is, there, there definitely is this spillover effect where things, because these sort of frequently seen things are now almost trivial, especially in a, in a high resource language or really only in a high resource language, then these, these other things kind of become feasible and we see improvements in the other things using the same methodology. Thanks. Yeah, so I think that's uh, that's time. But thank thank you everyone for your questions and for listening. <laughs>